Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, MNT Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Perfect Building Maintenance. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Avison Young, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International, NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Genova Burns, Handro Properties, Handler Real Estate Organization, HAP Investments, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., Peoples United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, Maringoff Family Foundation, The Moynian Group, and these friends. We have a lot of things happening in Washington. We have a lot of potential things happening in New York. We don't know where the market is. We have new banking regulations. There's a possibility of Dodd-Frank being revised or dismantled. I don't know what's really going to happen. What effect is this having on real estate and financing? So today I've assembled this group of banking executives to provide their insight on where they see 2017 under the changes taking place. My guests today include Ben Stacks, Northeast Market Manager for the Capital One Bank, Matt Galligan, who is the President of CIT Real Estate Finance, Barbara Bregman, who is Senior Credit Officer for Customers Bank, and last but not least, Matt Petrillo, who is the Area Executive in Real Estate Financing for M&T Bank. You see this, the world on a national perspective because you're over there. Everyone else is basically regional and so on. How do you see the, the feeling out there? How do you see banking and how do you see lenders looking at everything? You know, as we were saying prior in the green room, investment sales seem down. Um, there are certain positive effects because there's more office space being leased, but people are absorbing. How do you see this, Matt? Well, uh Banking in general, I think that uh, it's looking forward to change to some of the more draconian regulations that have uh, hampered us from being able to do what we uh, need to do, which is to lend money into communities. Um, I I think uh, people in general are concerned about uh, retail and to-be-built multifamily. Um, We had an economist in today that uh, was particularly concerned in the New York area about uh, infill multifamily, which surprised me. I would have thought that uh, more of the suburban multifamily. Um, but those are the two big areas that uh, there are concerns. We're transacting in uh, Class B uh, multifamily that's close to uh, transit orientation. We do a lot of that in California. We've done uh, a number of uh, office reposition type bridge transactions. And uh, we were talking uh, previously, uh, the <clears throat> the appetite and the volume is much uh, greater in the uh, western part of the country than it is here. And I think the reason for that is uh, 
the investment sales market has been very slow relative to uh, two years ago. But don't you see, uh, from the credit perspective, don't you see uh, borrowers saying, you know, I want to take my money off the table today. I want to lock in rates because we know that uh, Janet Yellen said she's going to raise the rates. And, you know, if I can lock in a rate, wouldn't it be better? We have a lot of customers who are doing their refinancing and locking in the rates and pulling out as much as they can. We're really taking a close look at that, at what they're putting their money into. Um, you know, we're, we're not overall concerned as long as the cash flow of what we're lending to is still there. That's what we're, we're lending into. Um, you know, so uh, the rates are what they are. They are going to go up over the next year, a, a few times. But even if the rates go up, We've been at historical low rates in yeah. the past, so you really need a couple of rate increases to really get us into a different right. situation over there. Somebody told me that for in the multifamily world, for every 1% increase in interest rate, you need a 4% increase in rental rates. So it's a pretty good metric that we're, we're looking at. You're looking at that, but if we're looking about New York City multifamily, which is rent stabilized, not rent controlled, we haven't had a rent increase in two years, basically. So, you, you know, that hypothesis is not really that good right. on that situation. And the, then the other situation is that the real estate taxes have gone up, the water and sewer have Operating gone up, the insurance have gone up. Right. You know, so it's a different thing. And the how, rates go up. And the rates. So how do you look at it? I mean, because all of, all of you are basically, and I don't want to make this in a d negative comment, you're conservative because you're looking at your very prudent bankers looking at to protect yourself. You're, you're not wild, crazy people, you know, who are saying, I just want to put out the money. I mean, I think it's true for all of us that we're sponsor oriented where we tend to be lower leverage. Um, and I think we're, you know, conservatively positioned um, to, to ride out, you know, fluctuations in the cycle. I mean, we're, we're you know, we're very conservative underwriters, um, and we, you know, as I said, we lend to the to the best sponsors in the market. So, um, it's a well worn path that I think right. we're on. But I mean, I think you know, but we're you know, at the same time, we're committed to it. Yes, there's a lot of noise um, in a variety of different areas, but I think that's where relationship banks are different in the long run. Now, you know, Matt brought up and Barbara brings up the the subject of infill, multifamily, and so on. The other day, I, I came off on a taxi ride, and I'm riding into the Astoria, Long Island City market, and I've, I could not believe the number of units being built. If you go to downtown Brooklyn, I see the same thing. If I go to Jersey City, I see a similar situation. I understand that there are more people coming over here, but these units have to be absorbed. How do you and the bank look at that? I mean, that, that supply. That, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It, it, there's there's a lot of supply coming on in in, in Long Island City and in, in downtown Brooklyn for sure. Um, you know, as Ben said, uh, it, it, we start with sponsorship and and you know the the you know generational cycle tested long term owners uh, is sort of the hallmark of our book. Um, uh, and on top of that, um, the um, you know what we're we're fortunate in that the amount of equity going into a, a transaction today is or the amount of credit support behind uh, a first mortgage, whether it be in uh, mostly equity, maybe a sliver of MES, is probably twice what it was in, in, in the prior cycle. So rather than lending to 80% in the, in, the, uh, in the first mortgage, then potentially with MES on top of that, typically we're getting to 65% today. Uh, maybe there's a little bit of MES, but when you think about the amount of dollars, there's, there's a dollar of, of equity behind for every $2 of debt. And we're sensitizing rates uh, and, and expenses very carefully. So, and, and I think we're going to see some softness. I mean, you, you, you know, that's part of our underwriting approach, um, and I think we would all agree with that. That you know, at some point, we expect this, mm -hmm. and, and you know, we think that you know, knock on wood, that we've been conservative enough in our underwriting that if there is uh, diminution in market rents, there's there's more um, concessions, uh, there's weakness. You know, we'll we'll be able to get through it. You know, there are a lot of changes in the in the real estate asset scene uh, and I'll give you one example one which I'd like to ask the opinion of all four of you but you know the the conversions of these industrial warehouses in Brooklyn and Queens to industrial office space mm -hmm. um, where you took a industrial space 
that had zero loss factor, and now every developer who's doing that is saying there's a 26.5% loss factor, so they're increasing the size of the building. It's a nice idea about having hot, chic, millennium type of space. I, I see so many buildings being acquired by people for that potential idea. How, do the, how does a bank look at a conversion of an office space? Well, let, let me give you a statistic that floored me. Uh, I was at a Collier's event in uh, Boston a couple months ago, and they said um, the uh, office vacancy rate downtown in the financial district was around 15%. And the office vacancy rate for floor 20 and above was 20%. Now that says to me that there, there's something to be said for demand for the kind of uh, facilities you're talking about. I think that, you know, a lot of this millennium uh, discussion, I think, is uh, not necessarily going to play out the way it's being discussed. But they do want to live, uh, want to work in uh, those types of facilities. They want a communal kind of environment, which is shrinking the overall uh, supply of office. And they're going to live close to those facilities. So uh, we're, we're doing one uh, in L.A. just um, outside of the downtown area in something called the Arts District. Um, so it's, it's not a uh, discussion that's germane only in New York. If I could circle back for one second and uh, try to address something we were uh, talking about. Uh, Mike, you were making the, uh, a very good point about the expenses in these buildings going up. And obviously the NOI is being pinched. What I find interesting is the dichotomy. Um, both of you guys were talking about uh, multi-generational sponsors who can live through that. You know, they, they can give concessions and ride through it. Mm. Uh, but if they have private equity money as their partner, that private equity money wants to be out in three to five years. They're going to get very impatient, and they're not going to be able to take uh, discounts and, and ride it through. And I, I think that's a very valid point. Uh, because when a private equity company, and that's where a lot of the money is coming in for the investments, they have a, a life of the fund five, seven years, maybe the longest. So during, you know, depending on when the cycle that they went into it, that property has to be sold or something has to, be, and it's taking a little more time. Uh, I, I think, you know, so industrial is one of my areas that I'd say retail today. There is no question that the proliferation of um, Amazon, uh, the shopping sites, you know, the food sites over there, Inst Instacart and all the other items are having an effect over there. The, the need that, you don't that Macy's is cutting their, the size of their stores. Everybody's cutting their size of the store. I mean, everybody sitting here has a retail exposure. You have a large retail mm -hmm. exposure. How do you look do. at that? Um, we look, we watch it very closely is the answer. Um, again, I mean, we, we're, we're comfortable with the, the leverage that we, uh, we have in the book um, and uh, the sponsorship behind it. Um, but I agree. I mean, you know, you look at, at, um, at uh, you know, Soho today or, um, you know, Madison Avenue has some softness for sure. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough place to get comfortable with a new deal, especially at the bases that, that things have been trading for in, in recent years. So he, let me pose this question. Of all the asset classes, what does your bank, what, what does customers' bank feel is the favorite asset class and the one that is the least favored asset oh, class? Oh, ours is absolutely multifamily. So That's the favorite asset that's class. That's our favorite asset class. So. And the least favorite asset class? Would it be hospitality? Would it be, you know, industrial? Um, in terms of real estate? Um, I think we look at retail and office pretty much the same. They go up and down with the economic cycles. Um, you know, it, it, we are very strict with the underwriting in those, so we tend to do them less unless something fits exactly into our box. And what about construction finance? We don't do construction. So we're not, we're not equipped for it. We're, we're a much smaller bank. Uh, we're just under $10 billion, so we don't want to expend our capital on that asset class. So I guess that's our riskiest. <laughs> yeah. uh, most um, favorite and least favorite. And then sure. I'll, sure. Sure. Um, I would say that uh, office we've done quite a bit of. Um, 
multifamily, we're, we're, we're certainly, uh, you know, we've done quite a bit of mo like workforce housing out in the boroughs in the past few years. That's a, a really safe asset class. Um, again, being at the right basis. Um, uh, least favorite, um, you know, we, we've had, we've done some land in the past. That's a tough asset if, if you're considering that an asset class. Condo today is certainly, it's more difficult to make sense and, and to uh, certainly to syndicate a large condo, uh, a condo development today, a luxury condo development. Um, so that would be my, my answer. I'm not going to single one out. I mean, I think you could go through every asset class, and, and if you wanted to convince yourself not to do it, you could do it, right? Saying no is easy. Of course. Saying yes is hard. I do that every day. And, and so, but I mean, <laughs> I, I think you could, you could say, look, condos are tough. We, we've done a lot of condos in the past. Class A multifamily construction is tough. Um, retail is tough. Office is tough. I mean, I, I think there, e each one of them poses their own challenges. But which Hotel, you know, I, I think you could maybe safely say that the only like really robust you know asset class today is or is in, is industrial yeah. um and and then i'm sure even then you know people will pile into that and, and maybe chase out the yield at some point um so I, again to get back to our, our original point you know i think you, you can somebody once told me you know every building deserves a loan it's just a question of how much and somebody and, so, and somebody once told me the other comment i'm happiest when I get paid off for a loan. <laughs> okay. No, nothing. Okay. I, it's always good to have my money out as a lender, but I feel very comfortable, even though I have to put it out again, getting repaid makes me feel comfortable. Look, so. you, you could say that about a construction loan. I mean, sure, because you don't know. I mean, you are taking <laughs> risk. You don't know what the market's going to be like when that delivers. But if you make a 40% leveraged, you know, you know, long-term loan on an office building or even retail so, or multifamily, so, so you, you know, it's you know, okay. when, when you're talking about a 40 to 50% loan, you're talking about our two friends of the, from all, Little Rock, Arkansas, and other market that we have all of a sudden – Locally, nationally, and everywhere, we have seen these two lenders who are, one is maybe a $12 billion bank, one is an $18 billion bank, and they're putting up more money than anyone else. They're following a little bit of what you said before. My leverage is 40 to 50% of cost. It's a market, and that's where the, their, their market is. When the world continues to be good, it's fine. But if we hit a 2008 recession, then the, it doesn't matter if it's 50% the cost because people aren't going to be buying. But there's a difference when you're 50% LTV on a land loan versus 50% LTV on a, you know, um, Midtown South Class B, you know, office building that's... You know, Here's a question. Since I have a lot of young millenniums who do watch my show who are in the real estate development, how do you... Okay, because I hear sponsor, 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 developer. How do you make a decision on who's going to be that next Douglas Durst or that next developer? I'm not even, you know, who, who, how, do you, how do you roll the dice? You've been in banking long enough. How do you yeah. make that decision? Well, we have uh, one fellow who's in his early 30s that we've lent a lot of money to. His uh, financial partner uh, is a very disciplined hedge fund uh, that uh, he's had relationship with the principal there his uh, whole life. So, um, and, and the piece of dirt is uh, a very safe asset, particularly at the leverage that we've lent it. Um, and, and our deal with him is that he will not build this property. He'll go out to a third party. Um, but my question in general is, you know, Every, you know, people go to the real estate institutes of all the schools. Fordham has recently started one. NYU has one. You know, Syracuse. All, all these places have these real estate institutes, and young people want to get into real estate. So they go out there, and they're 27 years of age, and they want to go and be a builder. How do you make the decision and go to credit committee or go to the credit officer and say, I, I have a gut that I feel that person's the right person? So for us, it's pretty simple. We're, we're, we're probably not going to lead a relationship with, uh, certainly, with, in general, we don't lead with construction, really, but certainly not with someone new to us, uh, uh, someone younger and without the experience. So where do they go? They partner with somebody with experience. What um, happens if Or they come out, they, they go to work for 
one of those companies that we do work with and then get their experience there. Look, there's also private equity money available today yeah. that's probably a little bit more expensive, right, than banks because even that market has compressed quite a bit in terms of pricing because the competition is very intense. And so I, I think it might be a cost of capital issue, not an availability yeah. issue. Yeah. And it may not be that the traditional banks or the, you know, a certain set of banks are, are the lender to those people, but I think there's other outlets. Let's, let's look at CIT for an example, and I'll even look at customers because they're both run by interesting executives and business leaders. CIT was, was and is a finance company. That's their main focus going back for years. They were in the factoring business. They were in the finance business. So they've taken additional risk. Couldn't they go at a higher risk and take this new developer, Mike Stoller, who's, a, uh, who's, who's maybe worked for Tishman or somewhere else, and he's trying to build and get a higher rate, like the private equity rate? Well, uh, technically, we are a bank, so we surrendered the, uh, the uh, finance company logo. Um, you know, when, when you're in the bank box, if I went into a credit committee and said I have a good gut reaction about this guy, it would open up a series of 25 more questions. So, uh, I think Even though the yield could be great. The, the yield is not, not going to satisfy a credit committee. I think uh, what Barbara said is, <laughs> you know, you're, you're probably going to have to get your experience someplace else, and you're probably going to have to uh, borrow money in the non-bank markets um, or joint venture with one of your classmates that uh, is a Rudin or a Resnick or somebody of that ilk. Right. So here's a, another question. You know, in today's world, we, we know that every asset class you can have a positive and a negative on finding. There are, you know, there are two asset classes that I've discussed. I think maybe a number of you might have been on shows with me about that. But what is your thoughts about the co-working space and the co-living space as a lender? So we have some experience, uh, some, uh, experience some exposure to, uh, to both, actually. Um, and um, I think traditionally it's certainly a, a lower sort of barrier to entry um, sector, and that concerns us a bit. Um, when we underwrite a co-working situation, um, A, uh, it's, we're, we're, you know, if it's a third of a building, I can probably get comfortable with that. If it's a whole building, that's a tougher that's a tougher test. The other thing is we're going to underwrite it to a fallback rent that allows us to, to re-tenant the building at a level that we feel is safe, that's, that's conservative, quite frankly, and make certain that we can still exit. Barbara, since, since you're in the multifamily <laughs> frame business, so co-living is right there. We, we actually haven't lent to an either one of them. Um, the co-working, um, again, it seems a bit more transient with the, uh, with the subtenants. Um, not sure where, when, in the next down cycle, where those small businesses, because it's typically smaller businesses, where they're going to end up. Um, in terms of co-living, uh, th those are fairly new and still, are there any up and running and stabilized and rented up yet? In essence, many of the apartments that you may be renting to on the multifamily have been in the co-living space for the last 20 years. It, right. it may not be called co-living, but uh, a, I've been to many apartments where four people share the, the four rooms, and they one of them or all of them sign the lease, but that's a co-living right. concept. So that type of co-living has been around, and it's acceptable because there's a lease over there. Yeah. The other co-living that we're talking about, which is common cohabitat, and we, we live is different. How, how have you seen, have you looked at those? We, we haven't looked at any, and I think that's uh, way too cutting edge for us to be involved in. You know, I, I think probably something like that uh, has a shakeout after, you know, a start, and, you know, good things come of that. But mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we'd be a leader in that arena. Ben? Uh, we've done some deals with some exposure. Again, not, you know, like a single tenant. I mean, I think the... You know, as as Matt kind of alluded to there, I, I, I don't I, I think we might need to see a cycle to see how permanent this this um, concept really is. I think it's a great concept, and I think that you know done right it can work. But I also Matt said too that there's um, no barrier to entry really, and I've we've seen a lot of Me Too 
um, concepts come in, and I, and I think that could be a, a real challenge well, to, well, to the When model. we talk about Me Too concepts, another interesting Me Too concept is the number of health clubs and gyms. And they're growing by proliferation, leaps and bounds. How, as a bank, do you look at these type of things? Because, you know, during a, a strong economic period, they do okay. During a weak period, you know, people say, I don't need to spend the X dollars per month, okay? And, you know, there's, the, the range goes from the Planet Fitness for $10 a month to the Equinox uh, Lifetime Fitness of $300 a month. How do you look as to uh, mm -hmm. that type of credit. Yeah, the same many of them in the, are in retail facilities yeah, and so on. Yeah, for sure. And, and the larger space users, uh, you know, often they're using below grade space, which is, um, it, it, it's a matter of underwriting to, to where you feel you can replace the rent. And, and if you're overly dependent upon a gym, someone with, as you said, without credit, um, or even, listen, leases expire. You can have a, a great lease, but to a tenant that decides to move on or that the space is too, or that, that, that their sector is too saturated, um, you know, we don't want yeah, it over. You know, I, uh, my over. favorite story is about 15 years ago, I remember a, a gap lease that was being executed on 3rd Avenue and about 65th Street, and everybody said, hey, it's a gap lease, they're never going to leave because they were the greatest thing over there. Today, that space has been broken down into some health club space below grade for the lower portion of the gap. Mm -hmm. The upstairs has been broken down into certain sports clothing stores and a yoga shop and a soul cycle. Mm -hmm. So the question is the adaptability of space. Right. Sure. Great use for below grade space, yeah, right? I mean, sure. it, for, it's just a matter of being too, uh, too dependent. Uh, on an another area quickly is, you know, we've seen the urgent care, the proliferation of the urgent care and the health care uh, because of the emergency room changes. And also, there may be a major change, you know, now with the president's planned change of Obamacare. How do you look at urgent care and health care in general as a lender? Well, I, I think it's hard to really get comfortable that uh, they're credit tenants. And uh, I, I agree with your adaptive reuse approach to the gap uh, property. You know, I, I think if they're in pretty generic space that you can get in and out of and it makes sense in that location for somebody else to come along, then you should go forward. I mean, unfortunately, we're playing that game with retail, whether it's a shopping center or if, mm -hmm. if it's on Third Avenue, you know, mm -hmm. there are no credit tenants anymore. Sure. So it's impossible to get uh, completely comfortable unless you think of the next option and the option after that. Right. So I think in, in summation, it sounds like, look, the, there is money available for real estate financing. Sure. It's at the question of the sponsorship level, the, 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 uh, the leverage amount over there, the asset quality, uh, and also depending on what the regulations are, on how they look at it. And uh, hopefully 2017 will be a good year for everyone and the banking community will continue. I'd like to thank Ben, Matt, Barbara, and Matt, and I'll see you next week.